<laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. My name is Adam Freed, and I'm a principal at Bloomberg Associates and was previously the sustainability director for the city of New York. Now, this morning, we heard Mayor Bloomberg talk about the real-world consequences of climate change, which are happening. And the past few years have shown the devastating impacts that flooding, particularly extreme rainfall, can have in cities. Here in Europe, last year, over 200 people died from summer floods. Streets in London were transformed into rivers by storms so strong that they're referred to now as water bombs. And 20 people in my home city of New York passed away, many in their basement apartments, from Hurricane Ida. And this year, this summer, we've already seen the floods in Pakistan killed more than 1,700 people, and almost 2 million homes were destroyed. As we heard in this morning's panel about heat, the impacts of climate change are not future warnings, but a clear and present danger here and now. In fact, many of you took a snap poll earlier today that found that over 50% of you have experienced flooding in your cities within the past two years. In cities that we know, and as we've heard about in a variety of different topics today, are on the front lines of all the impacts that we're facing. So I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome four national and international experts who are grappling with the realities of living with extreme weather events in their cities. Mayor Randall Woodfin from Birmingham, Alabama, Hank Ovink, UN Special Envoy for Water, Pierre Francesco Moran, Deputy Mayor for Urban Planning and Housing in Milan, and Melissa Martin, chef and owner of the Mosquito Supper Club in New Orleans. And I will also put a plug in, author of one of my new favorite cookbooks that you can find hopefully at your local bookstore, ask for it, <laughs> uh, which is a Mosquito Supper Club, Cajun Recipes from a Disappearing Bayou. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what that means at the end uh, when we get to the panels. But I want to start with you, Mayor Woodfin. You live in a city that actually doesn't have any major rivers. And yet Birmingham has experienced a series of significant floods during your terms and many just this year. Can you paint a picture for the audience about what's happening in your city? Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Adam made one mistake. Um, there are three national and international experts. I'm just a little <laughs> over here. I don't know about the expert part, but I will tell you, the city of Birmingham is a southern city founded in 1871. For you all who don't know, um, from a landmass you know, topographical standpoint, it sits in the valley. And this valley is sur surrounded by mountains. It has all the ingredients that make steel. So like a lot of other southern cities, um, we've had our boom and our bust. We had our boom in the late 18th, early 19th century. And in the 1970s, when the steel industry changed, um, so did it. we lost a lot of jobs at one time. Um, and our height of our population was 340,000 people that now has about 200,000 residents. Um, we've had to grapple with, um, unfortunately, environmental injustice stemming from soil and air issues for quite some time. And serving as mayor of the last five years, what I did know when I signed up for this job was that I would also have to compete with extreme um, weather events, such as flash flooding. Um, remember, we sit in a bowl. So we've already been dealing with tornadoes uh, pretty much since time. But over the last two years with these extreme weather events um, and the humidity in Birmingham and all these other things that converge at one time, just since January 1, everybody, we've had 86 water rescues in a city that's landlocked. That's kind of extreme when you think about it um, for firemen and firewomen who sign up for a job to put out fires, but they're doing water rescues. And so, from that standpoint, we have about 27,000 um, inlets in our city where we've assessed about 18,000 over the last few years. And many of them have lived their lifespan, they're expired. And so just in context, if we wanted to pave every street in our city, it would be about a $50 million price tag. But to get our stormwater infrastructure up to where it needs to be is at least a half a billion dollar price tag. And so from a neighborhood revitalization standpoint, there's much to do around this, but we're, we're seeking solutions, um, which includes um, how do we repurpose our empty lots in a city that's decreasing population by planting trees and other things to absorb, um, not some of this, this runoff water, but other things as well. In addition to that, we're looking at how do we support our greenhouse and be creative with our horticulture team mm -hmm. Um, as well as how do we get out of the asphalt parking lot business, which all these weather events allows 
rain to just sit on top because it doesn't have anywhere to go. And so these extreme weather events from a municipal mayor standpoint it will take partnership, partnerships from our working with our federal government and its infrastructure law. Um, this bill is a once in a lifetime for a city like Birmingham to get water infrastructure right. Um, and that will be probably our main partner. Now, Hank, many cities have been grappling with sea level rise and coastal flooding for decades. In fact, you and I first met in New York after Superstorm Sandy when you were advising both the city and the federal government on responses to that. But more and more, as we're hearing from Birmingham and other cities, cities are dealing with extreme rainfall and unprecedented surface flooding, something they've never seen. You've been advancing water as a global issue, including planning for the UN 2023 Water Conference. What is that event and how do cities and flooding fit into that agenda? Uh, uh, thanks, Adam, and uh, thanks to the mayor also for e explaining the, the local challenges. Uh, water comes at us in many ways and forms. Uh, too much, but also with heat, too little, and of course pollution, impacting uh, our infrastructure and environment, uh, but also our health, uh, increasing in quality, uh, you know, hitting the most vulnerable first and foremost, with then, of course, the longest time to get back on their feet. And Cities are the hotspots where these events happen, eh? with too much, too little, and the pollution of water. So that urban water agenda is of critical importance if we want to leapfrog towards a better future. Eh? We spend 99 cents out of every dollar on stupid infrastructure globally, <laughs> and only that, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that it's actually a very sad story because only in that 1% where we see salvation and beautiful projects, we think, oh, we're doing so great. No, we're not. Um, we're messing up. So that alternative, <laughs> that alternative that cities, community-led, uh, uh, society-based, can bring to the agenda of the UN is of critical importance because it's in that alternative where we have to scale and replicate the things that work, and not scale and replicate the things that do, don't, don't work. Now the UN, eh, United Nations, uh, seen often as a very complex um, thing. <laughs> I want to make sure I use the right language here. <laughs> um, this is where you can see a special envoy status yeah. comes in <laughs> handy. <laughs> Water touches upon everything in life. It's health, it's inequality, it's climate, it's infrastructure, it's cities, the environment, biodiversity. So water underpins everything we have. But the way we treat it, the way we organize it, the way we invest in it, actually undermines everything we have. And we just have a hard time understanding that. It's organized so fragmented, it has poor visibility, it's not top of the agenda. 1977, yeah, so I was, then, uh, I don't remember this, but the UN hosted the first conference on water, and it's last. Eh? Next year will be the second in the history of the UN. Uh, I have the honor to lead the Netherlands in our co-hostship of this conference, and we want to bring every voice to that conference. Not a conference to talk, but a conference to commit to action. This is not a negotiation. Water has no treaty in the UN. There's, you know, we, it, it's totally not organized, but what we bring there are commitments that come from communities, from NGOs, from individuals, from mayors, from private sector, from academia, as well as from national governments. In these coalitions of the willing is an agenda that helps us present an alternative for the things we're doing today. And I think it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. The next time I'll be 100 and I don't know. Uh, so <laughs> we only do it once. We better do it right. Uh, water is your best bet when it comes to investment. It is the thing you have to believe in. Uh, uh, but as a water ambassador, I've, I still, people too often agree with me and then do nothing, eh? go back to normal. Uh, and I think now is an opportunity where we can focus the attention on water insecurity, water and health and inequality and urbanization and food security, and then say, hey, wow, if we invest in water, it trickles down into everyone and every aspect in our society. If we get this right, there is an alternative. And if we can scale that alternative, there is a better future. I love that concept of water underpinning everything in life. And I actually think it goes very well into Melissa's book and, and the work that she's dedicated herself for. You know, Melissa, so far we, we've talked about the physical and economic impacts of flooding, 
but you focused on its impacts on cultural heritage and, and a way of life in Louisiana and where you grew up. In your book, you, you talk about the risks of climate change and how, what it poses for Cajun culture and the community you grew up in. And you even highlight and call out southern towns in southern Louisiana that you, you talk about as the first climate refugees mm -hmm. in the U.S. as their land is disappearing. How is climate change threatening Cajun and Louisiana culture, and, and how do we go about protecting it? So I grew up in a small town uh, called Chauvin, Louisiana, which is an hour and a half southwest of um, New Orleans. Um, uh, on the coast of South Louisiana, we've lost 2,000 square miles of land, and we're losing land faster than um, almost anywhere else in the world. So um, 2,000 square miles, that would be Delaware just disappearing. And I don't know a lot about the culture of Delaware, but um, I would like to know if it's going to disappear. Um, and so uh, whenever I started the restaurant, it was to tell the story of this place that um, is 300 years old, but is steeped in culture and traditions. It's a fishing village. Um, and then I put that story on, um, I put that story on a table to tell that story. And then I did again in the book. I think that whenever you have these complex issues, Issues and people don't understand them, it's best to sort of try to deli deliver the message every possible way you can. And so I used it um, at a restaurant and then I used it in um, the cookbook. Um, you know, Chauvin has um, a saltwater intrusion problem but because of the oil industry. Um, we, the oil industry dug um, 10,000 canals, I think, in an 80-year period, which caused saltwater intrusion, and that's why we lost our land. We already have subsidence, and yes, we have hurricanes, and yes, we will have climate change, and our water's going to rise, but really it's the uh, damming of the Mississippi River, and it's the oil industry, so it's kind of like a lot of man's problems um, of... Um, dealing with water and dealing with uh, the land that we had in South Louisiana. Um, if I imagine it before the oil field, I imagine a quite a sustainable place, like a culinary Eden. Um, people were doing things quite right. And I think whenever I think about the future, I think about rolling back sort of primitively, like I asked you the other day, or just a little while ago, like, why don't we have cisterns, you know? Like, why aren't we, like, collecting rain? After Hurricane Ida, after... Um, Everyone flooded. I went down to help my parents who didn't have a roof, and it was continuously raining, and it had just rained some, you know, um, insane amount, and I, they didn't have water for three weeks. So the first thing I did was build a rain catchment system, and so they would have water. And then it's like, well, but nobody else in the show van was doing this. <laughs> and so I think, like, we need to start, like, really basic in communities like that. Um, um, before we can tackle the larger problems. <laughs> Excellent. Now, Cesare Moran, Moran also faces extreme rainfall and you've had a number of floodings. Under Mayor Sala's leadership, you've been working to really rewrite the DNA of the city. And, and for those of you who haven't been to Milan in a long time, I urge you to go and see the change that's happening on the ground. You've been transforming underused roadways into pedestrian plazas. You've on your way to planting three million trees. You're depaving large swaths of the city. Why are these actions so important to the city's future? Well, uh, if uh, we want to face uh, some problems like f uh, flooding, uh, of course we have some uh, short or medium term solution that is uh, infrastructures. But infrastructures sometimes are uh, the solution for today, but a problem for tomorrow. Of course we have to do it uh, if we want to be sure to save lives uh, in flooding situations, but we have to think that uh, or we change the way we imagine our cities, or we will face a problem that will be bigger and bigger. Uh, floodings uh, uh, last year are worse than floodings some years ago because uh, it rains less but harder and harder. So we have to imagine cities that are different. That is what we are doing all together uh, even uh, today. That is why we are moving, as you said, from abandoned rail yard to new places where 65% of all the areas, it's uh, seven different areas, will be green. We, have, uh, we mapped the half a million of square meters uh, of areas we can um, make uh, some depaving. Uh, and we want to do half of this uh, gaul in the next uh, 10 years. That is part of a strategy where um, in a dense city like uh, Milan is and like many European cities are, uh, we want to uh, reduce uh, um, uh, soil consumption. Uh, and we think we can do it, uh, and we can also save place that the other people can use for new pedestrian area and new leisure area that is the future of the city. Now, Mayor Woodfin, I think everyone on the panel has talked about it's not just a climate challenge we're facing, but these are man-made challenges. 
Um, as mayor, you've made racial equity, environmental justice, really a central focus of your administration. I'd argue that climate change is only partly to blame for the flooding that we're seeing, um, that much of it is occurring not by accident, but by design and how we designed our cities. In the US, much of that design was shaped by redlining and historic disinvestment in communities of color, um, very, very deliberately so. How are race and equity, how have they impacted flooding in Birmingham and how you're looking to respond to it? So, so race um, sits at the center of the city of Birmingham um, and it's been probably since its inception. Um, I would dare say we were probably um, the poster child for redlining neighborhoods. So the city of Birmingham is a city made up of 23 communities, 99 neighborhoods. And when in the steel industry, um, black residents in their neighborhoods were right by these plants. And so well before we talk about um, these extreme weather patterns, um, the intentional design of redlining neighborhoods, um, putting black residents, a city that's now 70% black, putting black residents um, near these smokestacks, um, living in floodplains, living in areas where your ingress egress is surrounded by train tracks on all sides. All of this was definitely intentionally deliberate. And so in the last five years, everything we, we do is centered around um, justice, racial equity. We've actually created the Mayor's Office of Social Justice and Racial Equity where um, climate change has to be a part of the conversation um, because these extreme weather, weather patterns are affecting those neighborhoods, those same neighborhoods I just described, more so than other areas of town where they may stay in, on hills or heights. Now, Melissa, you've talked about in your book, you refer to water as our lifeline and our dark shadow. I'm wondering what you meant by that and, and you know, how cities that can face the circumstances that you're already facing now, very much the canary in the coal mine, can learn from the situation on the Gulf Coast. Well, I mean, I grew up in a town that's all fishermen. All the livelihood was fishing. Um, and so it was our lifeline. When I got off of boats, I would bob up and down because we were so used <laughs> to just being on boats. It's not only how um, people made a living, but how they feed themselves. My parents still eat 90% of what they um, fish themselves. Um, and like Ponishan, the um, Native American tribe that's been moved off their land, There's, they've been, you know, the first climate refugees, they've been moved to a place that... Um, is not near water um, and so in order to be able to feed themselves uh, they'll have to travel so that's like a very small um, you know um, example of a much much larger problem because South Louisiana pushes out so much seafood um, and so we have to fix the problem um, we have to build more land there um, we have to stop um, the saltwater um, intrusion um, or we're going to lose a lot of security. You know, the Port of New Orleans is um, the largest port in the country, I think. And um, it, it's just important. Now, I want to make sure that we end on a positive note and, and with a message <laughs> of hope. We, we hear a lot of doom and gloom. I wonder for each of you, you know, what's the solution to flooding you want to see more of? Uh, or what action do you want audiences to take, and, and Hank, you have you know, about a, a hundred different cities represented here, 40 mayors. Uh, what do you want them to take away when it comes to water? Maybe we'll, we'll go quickly in order. No, I, as I said, water presents us with the alternative. Invest in water, it trickles down to every aspect in our society. So uh, get together and act. And I think on the city scale, in your communities, this is where you can make it happen. I started a program in Asia called Water as Leverage, really using water as a catalyst for sustainable development, equity, climate action. And it is community-led, community-based with international organizations and expertise. And we're in this pressure cooker way, try building innovative solutions that present us with a better future. So it's amazing. It is possible. But we have to dare to do it. Eh? And also overcome the distrust. Eh? Uh, step over and say, OK, we, are, we might disagree politically and uh, from our backgrounds. But if we start to work together, we can build that collective capacity. So yeah, there is a better future if we focus on water.
Melissa? I think we have so many problems in South Louisiana. It's a really hard um, question to answer. <laughs> I'm just going to say really small. I think that everybody needs to have a rain catchment. You know, right. when we're in a, a situation where we're having water issues and there's no water for three weeks because of a hurricane, like why won't we have rain catchment? Why don't we have large rain catchments? And then why can't we recycle that water? Um, I think that that is um, something small, but it, it's such a larger problem. It's such a larger fix for yeah. I agree. Uh, we shouldn't treat water as uh, uh, not being part of a system. So we can talk about water, but also land, about uh, food, about part of a community. Second, water has no border, not a, a administratives and not for countries. So we should uh, have the capability to cooperate with different administrations, different states to solve the problems. Adam, I would just say water, as we know, is a basic necessity of life. As a quality of life issue from a municipal standpoint, I would just hope that, you know, it doesn't have to be a divide on, on solving this issue. It doesn't have to be Republican, Democrat, urban, rural. This is an issue we all should be behind trying to figure out how to solve, particularly on the extreme weather pattern side. So, so I think we've heard collective action, taking the, the small steps that are necessary, valuing water, and, and I'm, I'm going to quote you on the dare to do. Right. So thank you very much for joining us okay. today. Thank you. <laughs>